Good evening, everybody. It's actually a pleasure to be here in Montreal because Montreal is a beautiful city, but I'm, because I'm an alum now of Concord University since the past year, so this is my anniversary. <laughs> but it's, it's the first time that I'm actually speaking as an alumni of the university, and I definitely have an enormous amount of respect. And one of the alumni uh, of the university, Dr. Roy Gao Weiss, who has been working at NIDA, is in fact one of the very important contributing in our understanding of the effects of drugs. So certainly you all have uh, contributed in very important ways by, by training some of the best scientists in the field. What I'm going to do today though is I'm going to actually try to give you a perspective about one of the things that has been very challenging in psychiatry and I'm trained as a psychiatrist and is the concept of uh, the high, high rate of substance use that you see among patients suffering from mental illness. And it doesn't matter really what uh, the type of the uh, mental illness you are discussing it, whether it is schizophrenia, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders, anxiety disorders, individuals suffering from a mental illness are much a higher risk of uh, getting exposed to drugs and getting exposed to drugs becoming addicted. Similarly, we've also, it's very clear that individuals that become addicted to drugs by that process become much more vulnerable to mental illnesses and particularly notable is depression and in fact it is one of the reasons that once, once they are addicted and they feel depressed and if you don't treat the depression they will relapse. You really can, it's very difficult to try to get them to stop taking drugs because the depression itself drives them to take the drug as an auto-medication effort to try to feel better. And one can leave it at there and says well that's the reality. Now to me as a psychiatrist it was very frustrating because typically we separate the fields. We separate the fields of mental illness completely distinct for the treatment of drug use and addiction. And this is far from optimal because we don't even get trained on how to properly treat addiction in individuals suffering from it uh, like a patient with, with depression. And it can be very frustrating and I tell the story, I mean when I was a resident in New York University and I remember we admitted a patient with a severe depression who also had a, a history of severe alcoholism and so we started the antidepressant uh, treatment and the patient actually had very, very severe cravings. And I remember approaching uh, the, um, the, the basically the, per, the, the physician that was in charge that was overseeing all, all of us residents and I ask him, how do I treat the alcoholism? And he says, don't worry about the alcoholism. Treat the depression, and once he is discharged, let them treat the, the alcoholism someplace else. And this was one of the examples. Another of the examples is the very frequent uh, comorbid use of cigarettes uh, uh, among patients with mental illness. Most notable among patients suffering from schizophrenia. And it's notable not just on the fact that they are much more likely to be smoking, but when they smoke, they smoke a much greater number of cigarettes. And this is uh, actually the main cause of the decrease in uh, life expectancy. So individuals that are suffering from schizophrenia are actually jeopardizing their longevity by five or ten years just from the smoking behaviors. And, and, I, and, I, and this is just basically literally description of the responses that I get when I approach physicians and say in psychiatric units, well, you know, do you have uh, programs to try to address and treat the smoking, the nicotine addiction in the patients? And their response is, no, we, have, we are challenged by the treatment of the schizophrenic uh, symptoms and trying to improve on the recovery. So we don't want to challenge uh, the challenge brought up by trying to get them to stop smoking. But that's a very myopic perspective because that is going to ultimately jeopardize the well-being of the patients. So it's very frustrating clinically, but from the perspective of science, to me it's also an opportunity because things in, in, in nature occur because of a reason. And if there's such a high level of comorbidity, my perspective is if we understand what drives that comorbidity, we will be able to understand more about the mechanisms underlying mental illnesses of different types, as well as substance use disorders. We know now, and this was not known in the past, even though it's still rejected by some, uh, that addiction is a disease of the brain. For many years it has been categorized as um, uh, basically a, a fail, moral failure, 
as um, a weakened personality, someone that doesn't have sufficient self-control to regulate their desires. And in the United States and in many places in the world, it is criminalized. So people that are addicted to drugs are sent to prison. Now, with imaging technologies, it has become possible to actually investigate inside the brain of people that are addicted. And using these technologies that in the past were available for other medical conditions like cardiovascular, like heart disease or gastrointestinal diseases, we now with imaging can look inside the brain and try to determine what are the changes in the brain of people suffering from brain diseases. And one of the brain diseases is addiction. And in the past we couldn't. But when we apply it, and we apply it just we apply it for other now other conditions like I'm showing you here. So I'm using an imaging technology that what it basically does is it measures the, the uptake, the consumption of glucose by the tissue. In the lower row, you see the consumption of glucose by the heart. In one, the heart to the left is a healthy heart, and to the right is a heart of someone that so has suffered a myocardial infarct. And cardiologists can use this technology because they can see in the area of the heart that, that is not consuming glucose, sugar, that's the area where the infarct occurs, and it's not consuming glucose because it's actually damaged, and so it's actually no longer in need of glucose since it's not functioning. We can use exactly the same technology and see which areas of the brain on a person that's addicted to drugs that has lost the control over their intake, uh, that, that take them compulsively, and that cannot stop taking them even though they cognitively, consciously want to do it. You just cannot stop it. And using these technologies, for example, we have been able to identify, just like we do in the, in the heart, the areas of the brain that are not functioning properly. And what has emerged from these studies very consistently, regardless of the type of addiction that you're studying, all of them produce a similar type of pathology, which is it basically degrades, it decreases the activity of our prefrontal areas of the brain that are actually uh, responsible for our capacity to exert self-regulation, to control our emotions, to control our desires, to make a decision and carry through. All of those activities are not automatic, but actually are the result of these prefrontal areas of the brain. And, and, and addiction erodes the function of those areas of the brain. So now, with these technologies, we can say addiction is a disease, it damages the brain, and not only can we document that indeed there is damage, just like there is a damage in the heart with a myocardial infarct, but we can actually identify where and help uh, by the location of the area that is damaged, understand the behavior. In this case, this explains why people that are addicted to drugs cannot stop taking them even if they are risking ending up in jail or losing custody of their children because they cannot stop the strong urges of taking the drug. Their prefrontal brain regions are not functioning properly. The second thing we know, and as I mentioned it at the introduction, that uh, substance use disorders are frequently comorbid with mental illness. And I will be touching this later on because it's a, an important issue to understand. And I involve in many ways, and the way that I hinted on is if you are depressed, if you have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you may gravitate towards drugs because while you're intoxicated with them, they may make you feel temporarily better. In other words, they are acting as an auto-medication. The problem is that with repeated use, drugs damage the brain, and so those symptoms get exacerbated. So while acutely there may be some relief, with repeated administration, the relief decreases, and actually the performance becomes much worse. There's a, it's a, as I say, it's associated with multiple types of mental illnesses, and the, the greater the severity of the disease, the greater the likelihood of the comorbidity. So what is it that is driving this comorbidity? Well, we know that both for substance use disorder, as is the case for mental illnesses, there are multiple factors that underlie the occurrence of these diseases. Different from other mental illnesses, in the case of addiction, we know that there is a, a crucial component for the disease, 
You have to be exposed to the drug in order to be addicted. But we also all know that not every person that gets exposed to drugs becomes addicted, and only a relatively small percent that's estimated in general over average 10% of those exposed to drugs become addicted. So the question has been, what is it that makes a person vulnerable to become addicted when they get exposed to drugs? And we know that there are multiple factors playing into it, and one of them, and again, this interestingly, I uh, share many of the common factors that are identified in mental illnesses, where there are many factors that play a role in determining the emergence of a mental disease and its severity. Just as for addiction and mental illness, we know that there are extremely important components that relates to genetics, heredity. We see that, for example, approximately 50% of the risk of becoming addicted relates to your genes. And individuals that are born on families where there is a history of uh, alcoholism are much more likely to become alcoholics themselves even if they are raised apart from their biological parents. This is their genes influencing the behavior. Similarly, in the case of depression, in the case of schizophrenia, in the case of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, there is a very strong genetic component. And there is uh, groups all over the world trying to identify what are the genes that makes us vulnerable to mental illness and addictive behaviors. We also know that apart from genes, there are other biological factors that play very important roles. And I would say among the most notable is the developmental stage of our brains. So we know that basically 75% of all of the mental illnesses, and including addiction, occur before you are age 25. So they basically emerge as the brain is still developing. When we are born, our brain is far from having fully developed. It takes approximately 20, 21 years to reach its final adult form. And in the process, there are multiple changes that are occurring. And multiple genes are playing roles on determining how your brain will ultimately develop. And the environment in which we grow up will also play an extraordinary important role in how ultimately the brain develops. And so it's not surprising, therefore, that we know that environmental factors are important contributors both to the emergence of mental illness, as well as to the emergence of substance use disorders and addiction. What environmental factors are important? Well, consistently, for all of these diseases of the brain, uh, factors that are associated with social stressors increase the risk of these disorders. And what are the social stressors? Social deprivation, physical abuse, neglect, lack of uh, supportive systems, all of those factors increase the risk of depression, of schizophrenia, of substance use disorder, addiction, and other mental illnesses. Uh, and, and, and as I mentioned, and actually what we're trying now to do is based on this, we know that genes, brain development, environment, all of them are going to impact how the brain ultimately forms itself and function. And that's why the early stages of childhood and adulthood are so extraordinarily important, because they are very sensitive to what the individual is going to be exposed upon. And this is important to know, because as we think, of course, and as we gain knowledge, one of the big challenges in medicine, and certainly in psychiatry, is how do we prevent these disorders? And the most important thing that we can do to prevent these disorders is to provide an environment that is supportive and that minimizes the social stressors. And in this context, for example, families play an extraordinarily important role because they are the first line of defense for the child to be able to grow up in an environment where they feel protected and taken care of. And as I said, even though all of these factors are common to addiction and mental illnesses, and other mental illnesses, in the case of, uh, of substance use disorders, you need the drug. And it is the interactions between all of those factors that influence the brain that ultimately can result in addiction. And it's the interactions of these factors that influence the brain that can result in mental illnesses. But now we're also starting to realize that in some instances, the interactions of these factors with drugs can produce changes in the brain that might make you more vulnerable to a mental illness. 
So these factors, drugs themselves, are starting to be considered in certain instances a contributor to mental, other mental illnesses, not just addiction. And this is the, the number one factor, and, uh, and, uh, which, is, which has actually uh, led us to understanding much more um, how genes influence our behavior. And certainly we know how powerful they are, and uh, I think that the best example of biology are twins. And you can see how similar they are in terms of their physical appearance, their personalities, and their vulnerability for various diseases. And there is something more imprinted in genetics than in twin studies. And so we can use those also to investigate how uh, ultimately those genes, if you have a sibling that is your identical twin versus if you have a, a, a sibling that is not your identical twin, how does that influence ultimately your, your upbringing? and your brain development, because you also share the environment of the family. So with research, we now are, as I was saying, trying to identify which specific genes may make us vulnerable, but also importantly, which specific genes may give us resilience. And if these genes are making us vulnerable, to ask the question, why? How do they do that? And what we're learning, actually, is that many of the genes that make us vulnerable for mental illnesses and or addiction are doing so by modifying our brain during the early developmental stages when it's still forming, in such a way that it makes it more vulnerable, for example, for social stressors. So the way that genes are increasing our vulnerability for many of the mental illnesses and addiction is by influencing the development of the brain in such a way that it makes it more sensitive to social stressors that then negatively impact on its development. These are some of the genes that actually have been identified to be engaged in creating vulnerability for mental illnesses. In this case, what they are portraying is in the dimension of depression and schizophrenia. This, all of these genes, interestingly, what they are engaged in, in exactly the formation of connections between areas of the brain with one another. These are genes that we call neuroplastics because the brain, when we're born, is actually, as I say, not developed but it's going to be developed as a function of our experiences and what the genes are telling us. So it's a confluence of those two factors. And that's why when you're bringing up, when you're growing as a child, as a teenager, you can actually learn very rapidly. And your brain changes physically when you are learning. You're forming new connections. And if I were to say what happens, what, what, what are the main changes that happens during those 20 years of brain development, I would say, what the brain does is it increases massively the connections between one area of the brain and another. It forms these complex networks that were not there when you were born. You're born with many more neurons than you will have as an adult. So it's almost like, I think, like a sculpture that takes this gigantic stone and has to chisel off parts of the stone to generate the shapes. You have to get rid of many of those neurons. And those neurons that are, are left have to be optimized to do the functions that actually pertain to the stimuli that you're experiencing as you're growing up. And that's what triggers the generation of the networks. And that's why exactly um, physical deprivation, social deprivation can be so devastated, devastating to a, to a child's brain because it's interfering with a normal process that ultimately allows for those connections to form. Interestingly, these genes that we call neuroplasticity genes are also genes that are implicated in addiction. Why? Because when you get exposed to a drug repeatedly and you do have the vulnerability for addiction, what drugs do is they strengthen connections. They create new pathways. And if you have the genes that favor the formation of these new pathways in faster ways, you're much more likely to become addicted rapidly than if those uh, genes were not so efficient. And so it is therefore it's not surprising that we're finding that some of the genes that we are implicating in some of the mental illness are also relevant in determining how rapidly you transition from drug taking into addictiveness. Four, uh, adolescents, as, as we're learning about uh, addiction, uh, the fourth concept that is extraordinarily important is adolescence is a developmental brain disease. Like the other mental illnesses, it emerges um, late childhood, early adolescence. 
and your re greatest risk for experimentation with drugs in your, is in your teen years, and your greatest risk for addiction is in your late teens, early 20s. And there are many factors that account for that, the vulnerability. One of them is, of course, as I say, your brain is not fully formed. But in the way that it is not fully formed, it makes you specifically vulnerable. And in particularly, what we now know, very consistent across multiple types of studies, is that the connections, I told you that if I simplified what's the difference between an adult brain and the brain of a child, is that the brain of a child is not fully connected. And there will be many years before those connections get formed. And those connections get formed at different rates. And one of the connections that gets formed the last is the one that actually connects, and it's a bidirectional connection, it goes this way and that way, the prefrontal cortex, our brain, that I told you is necessary for us to exert self-regulation, to control our emotions and our desires, that connection of the prefrontal cortex with the limbic areas of our brain. And the limbic areas of our brain are the ones that allow us to experience emotions. And this explains why children and adolescents uh, feel things in much more intense way than an adult. And on the other hand, too, why it is much harder for them to regulate that intensity. And that, of course, has certain advantages, but it also has tremendous disadvantages, including the difficulty that they have in being able to control their emotions on the one hand that can lead them to actions that can be very detrimental, such as drug taking or engaging in very risky behaviors, as happens with many adolescents. But this developmental stage is of relevance not just for addiction, as I mentioned. It is so relevant for all of the mental diseases. And these are differences of the brain. And actually, what you see here is the colors. And it's the, the, the temperature color scale. So, and what you're looking at is the volume of neurons that you have of gray matter from when you are born, infancy to five years, to when you are 13 to 20 years of age. And you can see that it's going from reds and yellows into blue. Why? Because you are chiseling out the excess neuronal mass and you are basically optimizing the neurons that are then engaged already in networks that are processing specific types of functions. And this developmental stage is fundamental for the pro proper healthy brain. And changes in these developmental stages are associated with autism, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, anxiety, depression, conduct disorder, antisocial behavior, obsessive compulsive disorders, eating disorders, addiction, bipolar illnesses, and then uh, slightly depending on what stage, schizophrenia can emerge from ages 14, 15 on to the late teens. So there is a reason why all of these brain diseases are happening during that stage. That's a stage of tremendous vulnerability of the human brain, where you actually want to be able to provide a protective environment that will give it resilience. From all of these studies, and it's just I was emphasizing the notion about why adolescents are more vulnerable for addiction, and I said, well, you know, the prefrontal cortex is not uh, fully connected with the limbic brain, so it cannot regulate it. But we also know, and, and this is actually uh, basically, that that defect, that that uh, developmental delay, if you delay that connection of the prefrontal cortex with limbic areas of the brain, the, the prefrontal cortex in blue, the limbic areas in red here, if actually the longer it takes for those connections to form, the greater the likelihood that that individual would be having um, uh, basically problems with um, mental illnesses, and it's not just substance use disorders, they will be much more impulsive, much more likely to actually engage in drug taking, they will have much more higher likelihood of uh, having problems with attention, having problems with behavior and conduct, externalizing disorders. And from studies now we can use imaging to actually measure how densely connected the upper parts, the prefrontal cortex, are with these limbic areas of the brain. We can actually measure the fibers. And doing those studies, for example, it has been shown that uh, the denser the number of fibers, the better, better the control and regulation that you can exert. So this is a range of normal individuals in which the density of those connections that are linking the frontal areas with the limbic areas of the brain varies from very high to very low. And the, the lower the, the number of the fire, fibers, the greater the impulsivity in your behavior. And that, again, is associated with a wide variety 
of what we call in psychiatry externalizing disorders, conduct disorders, attention deficit disorder, uh, uh, substance use disorders. We've also, so what, is the, what that does determine, I mean, the question that we always want to ask, what determines this variability in the density of these fibers and on the speed at which these fibers are connecting upper areas of the brain with the limbic areas, emotional areas of our brain. And there are multiple factors that contribute, including genetics. But we also know now, and this is probably, in my brain, one of the most important findings that has emerged in neuroscience of brain development that deprivation, social deprivation, is probably one of the factors that has the greatest impact in interfering with the creation of those uh, connections between prefrontal and limbic areas of the brain. And studies, independent studies, have shown, and for example, children that have been brought up in orphanages where they have very minimal but, um, contact with, uh, with the caregivers, where they are devoid of that affection, actually show significantly delay connectivity in these areas of the brain. And moreover, the studies have shown, and these are, are some of the, the areas where the fibers, which is where they transverse from the upper parts into the limbic area, are, are significantly delayed, in this case in individuals that have been uh, raised in an orphanage. And in this particular study, the longer that uh, the kids have been in the orphanage, the worse the connectivity of those fibers. The worse, the worse the, they're actually the more, the, the, the less the development of those connections. And, and it's interesting because when, when, you, when you see data like this one, and I always say, well, it is very interesting to document that yes, we now, on, now can understand why social deprivation can, to a child can have such adverse consequences. But to me, the important question is how do we take that knowledge and you said to prevent children from actually have negative outcomes. And what uh, investigators have started to look at is if you already have this type of damage into these connections, if you do an, an aggressive intervention to provide support to try to compensate for the deficit during early childhood, can you help recover and accelerate that development of the connectivity of the brain? And there's pilot, pilot studies that actually show that indeed it can be done. And I think that to me that is the positive component to it, that we can do interventions to actually help protect those that are born in environments where they have been subjected to neglect. We also now know that drugs, exposure to drugs, particularly in childhood and adolescence, can impair specifically that same connectivity. They can, just like you see it with social deprivation in this case, that it actually decreases the strengths of those connections. Early exposure to marijuana has been shown also to resort in marked decreases in the connectivity of many of these same fibers. In this case, these are fibers that are connecting cortical areas, the posterior, part, posterior parts of the cortex, with, um, with a main, main node that allows us to actually exert consciousness and be aware of multiple things happening at the same time. Um, this is an area of the brain that we call precunius. It's one of the most connected areas of the brain. It's like, like a hub. I would like to say it's like the Chicago airport to all of the airports. Many fibers have to trans traverse through it, and, and so it gathers a lot of information. But also uh, fibers that are connecting, for example, with the hippocampus and prefrontal areas of the brain which actually are particularly important, those pathways, in the case of schizophrenia, because that pathway is actually allows for the regulation of these limbic areas of the brain. And in animal models, if you destroy those connections, it's actually one of the animal models that we use in, in order to try to understand symptoms in schizophrenic disorders. And in these studies uh, that use this type of imaging technology, it has also been shown that that the earlier you start smoking marijuana and the longer you get exposed to it during childhood, the worse the outcomes on brain development. So therefore we know that it's not just your genes that are going to determine how um, rapidly your brain gets connected, how the development proceeds, but that there are also factors in our environment that can adversely influence them. And very notable among them is of course social deprivation, social neglect, and the other one is early exposure to drugs.
So here we are again with the whole notion about uh, mental illnesses and substance use disorders and trying to see, well, why we're starting to, to, to collide. Well, if, if they are sharing similar, some of the same genetic uh, factors that underlie vulnerability by promoting neuroplastic changes, uh, by promoting the speed at which the brain can change itself by affecting directly those pathways, those proteins that are responsible for that by influencing exactly in the same developmental periods of great risk. When you are a, a teenager, a child, when you're extraordinarily sensitive to stressors and you're sen extraordinarily sensitive to drugs, where your brain is going to change very rapidly with exposure to these factors. And not only is it going to change, but that changes are going to be longer lasting. That could give us a clear cut explanation. And the other clear cut explanation as I was making it up too is you may have a mental health disorder and you are a child and it's starting to emerge, and you really don't have a diagnosis. You just don't feel right. And it may be depression, or it may be uh, early stage schizophrenia, where it's very difficult to diagnose, and you just don't feel right as a child. And, and so when you don't feel right, I mean, that, that sensation of discomfort is generated in our brain for a reason. It's like when you are hunger, uh, hungry, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it has a reason. It moves you into action to try to get food. If you are thirsty, it's the same thing. It's very uncomfortable, but it moves you into action to do something. And so when you are not feeling right, when you're feeling distressed, it's a signal that moves you into action to do something to make you feel better. And one of the things that teenagers actually experiment with, and it may be just by pure randomness, uh, because there's a lot of social activity as a teenager, and, and, and drugs are a way that teenagers interact with one another and it can be alcohol, or it can be marijuana, or it can be mar uh, Ill other illicit drugs. But, and, and if you take that drug, and you just sort of, again, you weren't actually even interested, suppose interested on the drug itself, but you're very sensitive to peer pressure, and there, the, those peer interactions are highly rewarding, and you take that drug by pure chance, and it makes you feel great, and you had never felt like that. You had always been horribly anxious, and all of a sudden, the anxiety is gone and you can concentrate on something else. Or that weight that comes from the depression and, and that everything uh, looks like a core and there's no excitement. And then you have this drug and it just makes you, gives you this excitement and drive and motivation and energy. And that can be very powerful and you learn it. And then of course you're going to be seeking it out because you want to feel like that. And that is one, probably one of the most important factors about why um, teenagers that have an incipient, incipient mental illness are at such a high risk of taking drugs. Because it actually, as I mentioned it, during, while they take it initially, it temporarily makes them feel better. And I actually, one of, of my points always has been when I speak in, to my psych, psychiatric colleagues, many of whom do not actually address mental, Ill, uh, mental illnesses with substance use. They treat them as completely separated. I said, if anything, what you, you, what, one of the reasons why I would tell you, you cannot just separate it. If you have a teenager or, or a child that's consuming drugs, that should be an indication to you to actually rule out that there is not an incipient mental illness that is driving that teenager to start to take drugs at a very early stage or when they are taking drugs at very high levels. So certainly for automedication. And, I, and, and how do they act? Well, I'm just going to give you an example just that to get you an idea of why, how these drugs can be so powerful in terms of uh, acting as automedications for individuals with mental illness. And I'm going to illustrate it with a very common drug that is abused by many patients with mental diseases and that's cigarette, nicotine. And nicotine is actually very prevalent. I mentioned it at the beginning of my talk in schizophrenia. It's also very prevalent in depression. And we also, always, when someone s smokes a cigarette, we all think about nicotine, and nicotine is an addictive substance. But when we're smoking cigarettes, what happens is we are actually inhaling a wide variety of chemicals, and those, some of those chemicals actually are pharmacologically active. And in the case of cigarettes, what we have been studying at um, my group at Brookhaven National Laboratory when we were there, is that these chemicals that come in the smoke, is not nicotine, profoundly inhibit uh, monoamine oxidases in the brain. Now, what are monoamine oxidases? 
Monoamine oxidases are enzymes in our brain, we all have them, they also exist in our body, but in our brain their function is to metabolize, to destroy dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. And these are very important neurotransmitters as they relate to our sense of well-being. So for example, the way that we treat depression is by giving medications that will enhance the content of serotonin, that will enhance the content of norepinephrine, that will enhance the content of dopamine. So therefore, not surprising, the pharmaceutical industry has developed medications that actually inhibit these enzymes with the idea that by inhibiting enzymes that destroy, you can raise the concentrations of these chemicals in your brain. Well, it so happens that when you smoke a cigarette, the chemicals in the smoke directly inhibit those enzymes. And you can see the, here with these brain images uh, the two types of enzymes that we have, monoamine oxidase A and monoamine oxidase B. This is a non-smoker and this is the concentration in the brain for monoamine oxidase A, very high concentration, again, deep areas of the brain, limbic areas of the brain. And this is an individual that's a smoker. And the color scale is here and you can see a very dramatic reduction in the concentration of the enzyme. Look at this one here for the monoamine oxidase B. There's almost no enzyme left. And when you take this, uh, the actually, and you measure, you can quantify, so it's not just that you can look at it, you can measure how much enzyme there is. These are normal controls. These are smokers. And you can see in this case, the smokers, there's basically no enzyme left in that brain. And in fact, the concentration is equivalent to the concentrations non-existent, they are no longer existent, of someone that is treated with one of these medications to completely block the enzyme in order to treat the depression. So cigarettes, what they are doing is actually producing something that antidepressant medications, some types of antidepressant medications are doing that is recognized to be therapeutically effective in improving um, depression. So in this case, you can say, well, is this bad? And I would say, no, 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 it's not bad that uh, cigarettes are blocking the enzyme. In fact, it is actually a factor that may contribute to the reason why people are taking them because it's actually acting as an antidepressant drug. Now, of course, it's not an effective antidepressant drug because it's actually full of uh, untoward side effects, apart from the fact that nicotine can be highly addictive. So you are inhaling a product that is very toxic to your health that you could get actually by one of these medications that is specifically inhibiting the enzyme without the adverse effects. But this type of knowledge, for example, that links uh, gives us a, an understanding about why people that are depressed have such a difficulty stopping smoking, has led us, of course, to develop new treatment interventions for patients that are smokers that not only give them nicotine replacement therapy, which you can give by a patch, for example, but in parallel, now we're treating them with a medication that blocks the enzyme so that they no longer crave the cigarette because they want to have that um, uh, increase in the concentration of these, of these chemicals. So we give them the medications that can account for that. And the results have shown that actually that results in a much better outcomes. So that's the element that goes, and I'm exemplifying it for, for depression, but the same exists, for example, for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where it has been shown that nicotine improves cognitive performance in individuals with ADHD. It improves their attention. Um, in schizophrenia also, it has been shown that smoking cigarettes or nicotine itself can improve their ability to, sustain, uh, to perform working memory tasks. It improves actually their perceptual capacity. And so what we're doing now is to, based on that knowledge, just like we did with depression, try to figure out ways in which we can deliver, in this case it's nicotine, it's not, not a chemical uh, that is inhibiting the, inhibiting the monoamine oxidase, which is not nicotine, it's a chemical called harmine. But for the um, enhancement of perception that you see in schizophrenia, or for the enhancement of attention that you see in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it is nicotine. So we are now evaluating other ways of delivering nicotine that may provide benefit to patients without having the untoward side effects of the, um, the chemicals that you inhale when you are smoking cigarettes. 
And for example, there one of the, the, the approaches that we're now testing is the electronic nicotine delivery systems to see if it actually can provide improved cognitive and perceptual, percep perceptual performance in individuals suffering from schizophrenia. But then there's the other side of the directionality, and that actually has been much uh, more complex than this one. The automedication is, is actually very easy to understand in many ways. But the other one, which is very challenging, is does the use of substance use disorder, particularly if you start again, everything that you start, the younger you start, the worse the outcomes. Um, exposure to drugs, can they trigger a mental illness? And, and there is data from epidemiology that has shown, that have followed prospectively children as they grow into adulthood, where they have clearly identified that the drug taking preceded the mental illness in such a way that it could not be stated that the comorbidity was because the individual was trying to automedicate because the drug use started before the mental illness. In my brain, I, I, the confound that I always see with something like that is that when a mental illness is emerging early on, it's not easy to recognize. So I am not so certain that we can, with all our authority state, that we're certain those individuals were not already suffering from very emerging symptoms that we could not recognize. So it is an important question, nonetheless. Can drug exposure early on produce changes that are, make you vulnerable for mental illness? We do know that if you take drugs, it's actually, and you have a mental illness, it will exacerbate it. And it will exacerbate it in the long term, whether you have depression or whether you have schizophrenia or where you have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or an anxiety disorder, it will exacerbate the condition and it will be make it much harder to manage. But the question is, um, can you generate and trigger a mental illness? And I would say, before I get into some of the examples, the way that I view it right now, and I, you already show, I saw you data that directly illustrates that drug exposures can change the development of the brain. And in so doing, of course, it's going to increase your vulnerabilities. So if you, on top of that, have other vulnerabilities like adverse social environments or a genetic vulnerability, all of these factors combined could trigger the mental illness. And it is possible that any one of them by themselves would have not done it, so that the drugs by themselves would have not done it. But it's the confluence that triggers the disease. And it is also possible that if drugs were not in the picture, the disease may have never emerged, or may have emerged later, or may have emerged at a lower severity. And that's where, a lot of the, where, where I think a lot, a lot of the, the reality lies. And, in, and I show you data that indicates that drugs affect the developing brain. They also affect the chemistry, but they also affect the, the function of the brain. And it affects them not only when you are young, it affects it at all ages if you take them. And this is illustrated in this slide, and I actually uh, shows uh, what we now know, and I would say again, I'm going to bring the name of Dr. Roy Weiss, who actually did all of his training and work here at Concordia University, who was the one to uh, uh, understand the mechanism by which drugs of abuse produce addiction. And he found many years ago are looking in animal models in rats that all of the drugs of abuse, regardless of there being legal or illegal alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, marijuana, heroin, all of them increase dopamine. And that capacity to increase dopamine is what makes them addictive. Why? Because dopamine is stimulating, is a chemical that stimulates reward centers in the brain. And it stimulates them in such a way that it generates a memory. So it's not just that you feel pleasurable, if we just felt pleasurable, it wouldn't have more consequences. Well, it has consequences because that very intense pleasurable response associated with very sharp increases in dopamine creates a memory, a long-lasting memory. And that's what ultimately can lead to addiction. And in the process, because drugs are doing this, they are increasing dopamine, they are flooding the system, and dopamine sends its signals to these molecules that we call receptors. And that is when you are taking a drug. This is cocaine. Cocaine increases uh, dopamine because what it does, it just blocks 
the recycling process. There is a protein, a transporter that brings dopamine back into the cell, but cocaine blocks it, so dopamine cannot go back into the cell and accumulates, and this generates this sensation of pleasure. When you are not taking uh, drugs normally, and uh, these receptors are there not for us to take cocaine or, or drugs, they are there to actually be stimulated by dopamine, by stimuli that require our attention, that we need to pay attention to because they are uh, important for survival. And so they are important for survival because they be necessary, for example, to associate the pleasure of eating uh, in such a way that it will motivate your, your behavior to seek it again, or the pleasure of, of, uh, of sexual relationship because it will motivate you to seek it again and be able to procreate. So behaviors that are indispensable for survival actually release dopamine and activate these receptors. But drugs do it much more potently and in an artificial way. So what happens when you actually uh, bathe the systems with so much dopamine, the system adapts, what we call homeostasis. And all of our biological systems function with this homeostatic principle. And what homeostatics try to do is to keep you at a certain range. So if you are overstimulating with dopamine, the system is going to try to downregulate that. And the way that it downregulates is, is by decreasing these receptors. So that the next time you take cocaine, this, of course, will uh, stimulate the, the few receptors that are there, but your experience would be much less so. And that's why you become tolerant and why you need higher and higher and higher doses. But it's also very important because it also means that when you are not under the effects of the drug and you already have these adaptations, you feel really bad, and, and stimuli do not motivate you or drive you. You are not excited by your environment, and it becomes extremely difficult in the context of low motivation for things that are not related to the drug and the impaired activity of the prefrontal cortex to be able to engage on actions that are not related to drug taking. And so you see, for example, here, this is actually shown, we've been studying a wide variety of drug addictions, in this case, cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, heroin, measuring these dopamine receptors. And in all of the addictions that we've studied, that we see that the receptors are going down. And this, in, in, in animal models, we actually can make an animal addicted, and we can see the receptors going down, but we can do gene therapy in animals, elevate the receptors, and that profoundly uh, interrupts the, the, the consumption of drugs. So having low levels of receptors makes you vulnerable to, com to basically uh, compulsively take drugs or to compulsively engage on other types of behavior. So it's one of the factors that is associated with uh, the, the escalation of drug taking in addiction. And also, what we have shown is that this reduction in the receptors that you see across a wide variety of, of addictions is a, what is, appears to be driving what I showed you in the first slide, the reductions in activity in the prefrontal cortex. So these areas of the brain actually modulate, so I was telling you that goes from the cortex downward, but it also goes from downward upward. And when the signaling from this uh, receptor, specifically this protein, is actually damaged, the activity of this prefrontal cortex becomes actually uh, impaired. And you can see that this is cocaine abusers, this is alcoholics. The lower the levels of receptors, the lower activity of these areas of the brain. And it's very, very notable because it's actually what it's telling us is that drugs are, are down-regulating, are decreasing uh, these receptors that normally allow for these prefrontal areas of the brain to be functioning properly. And so as you bring them down, those areas are going to be impaired. And what is very remarkable is that the areas that are uh, particularly sensitive to these uh, negative effects in the prefrontal cortex correspond very much to the same regions that have been found to be abnormal, profoundly abnormal, in patients suffering from depression. And you see it here. And it corresponds to the ventral areas of the prefrontal cortex. And then you can start to see why, if you get exposed to drugs, that could make you more vulnerable to depression. Because by bringing down the regulation of those receptors, you're going to be impairing the function of this area of the brain 
that actually when it's not functioning properly, put you at very high risk of depressive disorder. And so you ask the question, well, what does this region do? And, and how is it linked between addiction and, and depression? And what I can tell you is that the way, and as I think about it, um, in depression, one of the things that happens is there, are fi there is a fixation on negative thinking. And what you have to deal with and in cognitive therapy, you try to engage with a patient, is for them to create a different perspective of the world, of the reality, that not everything is negative. So it's almost like you are teaching them to change their automatic mode of judging events and ruminating into obsessive thinking. And in addiction, this area of the brain is actually the one that is responsible also for ruminating obsessively about the desire to take the drug. And it's also associated too with the, 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 negative, the negative emotions that emerge in the person that is addicted at the prospect of not being able to take the drug, which also then explains why individuals that are addicted to drugs frequently suffer from comorbid depression and why it is very important as we are dealing with the issue of how do we take this knowledge, not just in prevention, but also in treatment, the recognition that if we want to treat a mental illness where there is a, a, a substance use disorder, you need to address the substance use disorder in order to actually optimize the outcome of the mental illness. And the same thing with a substance use disorder. If a patient that is addicted to a drug is suffering from depression and you do not address the depressive symptoms, that individual will relapse. And if you ask patients, which is also something that I like to do, why is it that you take the drug? Because we always, academicians, feel that we know better. But the reality is we know better in our theoretical models. The patients suffer the illness. And one of the most frequent complaints that they say leads them to drug taking is depression. So where do we go from here? And I would say that this knowledge actually is specifically relevant both for prevention of mental illness and substance use disorders and for its treatment. And what's interesting about prevention of mental illness and substance use disorders is again there are many common elements and it's not surprising. And the common elements, I like to look at them, depends basically uh, decreasing all of the risk factors. And all of these risk factors are actually associated not just with higher risk of substance use disorder, for some of the externalizing and even some of the internalizing mental illnesses. And that means increased uh, individuals with early aggressive behavior at much higher risk of externalizing diseases, poor social skill, higher risk again for a wide variety of the brain diseases, lack of parental supervision and support, substance abuse, drug exposure, I told you influences how the brain develops, drug availability increases the likelihood that you will try it, Poverty. Poverty because it provides with a social stressor and an environment where you cannot necessarily predict uh, that you will have the support that is necessary. The domains that involved uh, in terms of the risk factors that you need to decrease, individual. How do you strengthen? How do you help someone with poor social skills or aggressive behavior? The family, extraordinarily important. And I highlighted it for the substance use disorders because we know that it's the first line of defense for preventing substance use disorder. But it's also one of the most important first lines of defense for the prevention of mental illness. And if we cannot prevent the mental illness and the mental illness still emerges, the family is the most important support to ensure the optimal recovery of that individual. The, the peers, the school system, the community, all of them can get engaged in actually helping bring this down and elevate all of this. So there is a component when we do prevention of reducing risk factor, but also providing an environment that will enhance our factors that can provide resilience. And again, the community, the family, the school system, the peer, uh, all of them can intervene, as well as interventions that go to the individual themselves. And similarly for treatment. And I'm actually providing a notion of the treatment, how do we take this knowledge for the treatment of, of drug addiction, but you can apply it also for mental illnesses. We've shifted our way of trying to think about uh, all of these mental illnesses, and I include addiction as one of the mental illnesses, 
where in the past we were trying to identify the area of the brain that was responsible for schizophrenia. A lot of work went into the hippocampus, a lot of work went into the prefrontal cortex, some work went into the thalamus. Then we were speaking about the depression, and I show you this area in the ventral part of the prefrontal cortex called the Brodmann Area 25. A lot of interest went into this area, but then it became evident that the amygdala was also important, that some areas in the hypothalamus were important, that some areas in the thalamus were important. And similarly in addiction, multiple areas. We thought initially it was the limbic brain that drove our desires, and rapidly it became evident that the prefrontal cortex gets impaired in drug addiction and drives the lack of control. And so what we're now realizing is that uh, mental illnesses actually involve disruption of multiple circuits in the brain that are responsible for several functions. In the case of addiction, and, and there is tremendous overlap, and I say the damage that you see in one circuit in addiction is also, some of these circuits are also damaged in depression or in schizophrenia. So in the case of a non-addicted brain, we like to actually simplify it in, in simple terms, the areas of the brain that allows us to exert control, my prefrontal cortex. I can, I can have a chocolate and I want to eat it, or I can have a glass of wine and I want to drink it, but I say, no, it's not appropriate for me to give a talk when I'm intoxicated. And I may be dying of thirst and I'm really, really craving it, but I say, no, I make actually, the, I pass it to my brain and I say, no, no, it's not right, don't do it. And I say to my, my, my prefrontal cortex, t t tells my basically brain, my drive's brain, uh, no, it's not right, even though my amygdala and limbic and I, and I love chocolates and I'm hungry and I want a drink of alcohol, it's telling it, feel, it will feel very good, but my prefrontal cortex says, no, it's not right. And I can just stop it, and I stop. If I'm addicted, my brain has been changed by drugs. And what it has been changed is that the prefrontal cortex, because I was telling you, the, the receptors down regulations leads to very impaired function of the prefrontal cortex. You've generated these very powerful memories. I told you drugs, it's not just about the pleasure. If it were just the pleasure, it would be no, no, no big deal. The mo it's imprinting a memory that's linking that, that pleasure with the expectation of getting it again that drives the behavior. And that is an, a memory that is stored in the amygdala, in the limbic brain, and activates the reward system. And that's what drives us. The reward is what drives us. It's the way that actually nature in, ensures that we do things. If I'm starving, the reinforcement of actually getting out of that state, there's a point that actually if I'm starving for three or four days, I will do no matter what in order to get the food. And that's exactly what happens when a person is addicted. You are generating a mental state akin of that of a person that is in a state of deprivation where the signaling is akin, akin to this is the most important thing you need to do in order to survive. So the prefrontal cortex cannot reason and say, no, it doesn't make any sense. It is the drive that takes over. And the person is unable to stop. And when you speak with people that are addicted, you ask them, I mean, why are you taking the drug? You knew you will end up in jail. You were on parole. You knew you were going to have next day to give a urine. And why did you take it? It makes no sense. And they will tell you. Many times they've told me the same story again and again. I don't know why I do it. The drug is not even pleasurable. I just cannot control it. I just cannot control it. And I think that that, that tells the whole story, the loss of control in addiction. And the moment they take that drug, that triggers this compulsiveness to want more and more and more, the escalation that relates to these very powerful memories that generate these positive feedback circles. And it becomes an automatic behavior. And if I want to give you an example of what an automatic behavior is, it's actually when the stimulus does not get into your prefrontal cortex, but you react. So if I have a stove and it is hot and I touch it, I immediately withdraw my hand, even though I am not aware that I am withdrawing it because it's hot. It's an automatic behavior. That's exactly what is generated in the, in the brain of a person that's addicted that actually generates an automatic response upon exposure to the drug. And that's why it's so extraordinarily difficult for an individual that is addicted to drugs to be able to stop taking them when they are in an environment where they've been exposed to it. There are other factors that trigger this intense desire, like stressors. Stressors activate the same systems and lead them to, tra to take them.
And one of the most powerful stressors is, of course, depression. Depression can lead to this type of behavior. And in the mental illnesses as well, actually, if you, on top of this, uh, identify someone that because of the drug taking uh, actually suffers from depression that actually perpetuates and exacerbates the likelihood that that individual will, will continue to relapse. And using this knowledge then, you say, well, how do you use it for treatment? And how do you, this knowledge about the networks, how is it relevant for treatment? Well, we know that mental illnesses and addiction can be treated. And we basically have several medications that can be used for some of the addictions. We have several medications that can be used for uh, mental illnesses. We also come to recognize that by medications by themselves are not sufficient. And that it is incredibly important that we structure interventions to help actually improve uh, the function of these networks. The brain is very neuroplastic. And, 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 I, and one of the, the areas where we've seen some of the most uh, rapid advances in terms of recovery of the brain is in individuals suffering from strokes. You can have a patient suffering from stroke that actually damages the whole area that allows them to speak. And through proper rehabilitation, aggressive rehabilitation, we can make that individual to be able to speak again. Or suffering someone from a stroke that does not allow them to walk. With very strong rehabilitation, we can help that individual walk again. And why? Because the brain is neuroplastic. And so my perspective is, whether it is that we're discussing an individual suffering from a, a severe mental illness, moderate mental illness, a severe addiction, we can do interventions, and that's the area of research where we're actually trying to engage more and, and more investigators, strategies to strengthen, for example, the, the circuits that allow us to exert self-control and self-regulation, to strengthen the circuits in the amygdala that leads us to be emotionally reactive in ways that are inappropriate, that leads to addiction, that leads to post-traumatic stress disorder, that can actually strengthen the motivational reward circuitry that is disrupted individuals with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or with depression, that we can do interventions that allow for the brain to be able to be flexible and adaptable as a function of their circumstances. That's ultimately what we want the healthy human brain to be, to adapt to the environment and to enjoy those experiences. Ultimately, the human brain is probably the most complex system that we know of. And, and we are just starting to look and understand how it works. And in the process, we come to realize that we have done, uh, that we have made many mistakes in the past, and that many of those mistakes actually have been very painful for individuals suffering from mental illnesses and addiction and to their families. And the way that I see it is that while we may not have all of the answers yet about how to treat these diseases or cure them, one day we may be, what we do have now is the knowledge that should actually allow to change our perspective as a society on the way that we treat individuals with mental illness, including those with addiction. Thanks very much for your attention. Would you comment on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to help control the drug and alcohol consumption? Yeah, and, 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 and this is relates to actually the treatment, um, because you go to 12 steps on Alcoholic Anonymous when you have an alcohol use disorder. And, and the issue is why, uh, how those 12 step programs help an individual actually be able to control the urges of drinking. And there are many factors that are likely to be important uh, in uh, active ingredients in, in this intervention. And to me, one of the most important ones as I think about it is in a person that's addicted to drugs and that includes alcoholism, one of the things that happens is your social infrastructure gets completely damaged and eroded. And we as humans are, are highly social. And one of the most important reinforcers is the social acceptance of our friends, of our family, of our community. And one of the most powerful social stressors is that rejection. And when you become an addict and with all of the stigma, first of all, 
you self-depreciate yourself. Your self-esteem is very, very low. And, and you also feel the rejection of the others because it is there, it's stigmatized. And that isolates you. So one of the things that, that these 12-step 12 12 groups does as, a, as an initiation is it's not judgmental. It provides you that environment, that extremely important social context and that support. So I think that's a very important factor that is therapeutic for individuals suffering from substance use disorders. It's not the only one, but I, 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 I'm convinced that that's probably one of the most relevant ones. And indeed, one of the big challenges in terms of when you have someone stop taking drugs and what you want them to get into recovery is to ensure that they will have a strong social support system because without them, their likelihood of relapsing is very, very high. And these Alcoholic Anonymous groups that actually can provide that and that can sustain that support for many years. And the extent to the which the individual can engage in these projects, in programs and can really get integrated into them, the greater that they are able to do so, the more beneficial it is for them. What would you say about the, or the main foundations of Alcoholics Anonymous, the experience of a higher power which enables you to, to help in this process? Well, that is one of the tenets of the 12-step programs, and in speaking with individuals that actually uh, have gone through those programs, some of them have rejected them because they say up front, I'm not religious, I don't believe in a higher power. But I've also encountered some that I said, I don't believe in a higher power, but yet the model of feeling that I can relinquish, that there will be someone that can, can actually protect me, that sense of protection becomes very important the sense of not being lost. So it actually works in some, I mean, and again, 12-step programs work in some people, it doesn't work in all. And, 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 I, and again, some of the, the reasons why some don't even want to go there is because they say I'm not religious. But on the other hand, there are others that do respond to it. So that again illustrates how you cannot just come up with a recipe and say everything is going to work for everybody. You have to be mindful, and the same thing applies for mental illness is not that you have someone that is, this is depression, you have an individual, a person with depression and that will give it unique, an, a unique characteristic. The same things with substance use disorder and you need to understand that for your treatment. So with a, with a, with a concept of, of the mystical experience, what is important in general and also very important for prevention, um, we've come to realize that having something that sustains you, that motivates you, that drives you, whether it's mystical or art or a sports or something that you feel passionate about, that is going to be therapeutic. And if you have that, that is a, a provides you resilience against, uh, against uh, addiction. Um, I have two questions. The first is, at the beginning when you showed the imaging of the a uh, healthy brain and a brain of someone who's addicted. Um, I was wondering if you actually successfully kick the addiction um, and if the brain goes back to a nice picture like the normal brain. Well, we tried to do that uh, for many years and, and what I can tell you is so, some individuals you do recover a lot and some you recover less. And what we're trying to do is, what is it that we can do to accelerate the recovery? So there's tremendous variability. And, and, and so the question is, why? why? And, and in, in one of them is, of course, if you have a very long history of drug taking, the longer the history. We've also seen that individuals that tend to consume multiple drugs tend to have the most damage. And, and then, like with cigarettes, there are some people that can smoke and they never had really any problems with with cancer and not even with pulmonary diseases and others are very sensitive. So we see that tremendous variability in terms of how much drugs can damage your brain. And, and in, in my view, again, is where a lot of the, the science is moving us towards is the concept of personalized medicine, where you can do an intervention that is going to be tailored to the unique characteristics and susceptibility. We're not yet there. But the idea would be, one, if you were to ask me in, the, in the, the psychiatry of the future where I would like to be able, 
is to actually evaluate the brain of a person that has a mental illness and or addiction and understand which are the circuits that are harmed, how they are harmed, and based on that information, take advantage of those circuits that are strong to try to buffer, to compensate deficits, and strengthen the ones that are weakened. As we're developing now new stimulation technologies, for example, where we can actually, through our, our electrical currents or to magnetic currents, we can inhibit or activate certain areas of the brain non-invasively, or even using peripheral stimuli. And the last time I, last time I came to Concord University, they were showing me a stimulator that was stimulating the glossopharyngeal through the mouth uh, that was being used to treat uh, spasticity in most, multiple sclerosis. So the development in these areas are very, very exciting. The ability to, to stimulate the brain from the outside may in the future allow us to do that. And so can you strengthen these areas or not? And in that case, if you have someone in whom there is not complete recovery, that it's not recovering by itself, can you do an intervention like this one so that you can return the brain back to normal uh, or uh, to close to normal as you can. You may, there are some instances where it may, they may you have may suffer irreversible damage and there's no, so you, you can achieve so much. So, but, but I think that we definitely can accelerate the recovery and in many instances we may be able to regain many, many of the functions that are damaged by drugs. And my second question is, um, thinking back to the two pathways, the genetic and environmental pathways that ultimately can lead to addiction, um, often the two are linked. Uh, in other words, um, if a child has parents who are addicted, um, then they inherit the genes. Um, the parents have inherited the genes from their parents. Um, and at the same time, the behavior of the parents, if they're severely addicted, may lead to neglect and deprivation and uh, the kind of stress. So I say to myself, what hope is there for these kids? On the other hand, I work on a youth service, um, and sometimes I see kids who come from such families, and they have never taken drugs in their life, and they swear they're never going to take drugs. They come because they're depressed. And I'm just wondering how it is that these kids develop this determination not to take drugs um, and put themselves at greater risk, maybe because they were so turned off by their parents, they just, you know, were determined to not identify with them. But uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, and it just uh, really exemplifies the diversity of humans, right? I mean, there are kids that in very um, adverse environments actually have an enormous amount of resilience. And then there are others that become very, very vulnerable. And you don't choose. You don't choose whether you're going to be, have those resiliency or the vulnerability, like you don't choose your parents or your environment. You are thrown into it. And, and it is that interaction of the environment with your genes that ultimately will determine who you will become as well as the, whether you a, a end up with a mental illness or not. I think that from the perspective of how do we do is recognizing those children that are at high risk and, uh, and based because of their environment or their personality characteristics, like, like poor self-control is one of the factors, the best predictors actually of negative outcomes of mental illness. So, uh, but it is actually one that is malleable. So you can actually strengthen self-control and there are multiple evidence-based interventions there. So it is the concept of, again, the universal prevention and then the tailored prevention interventions on the basis of, for those kids that may be particularly vulnerable. So I do think that there are many things that we can do. Uh, the, and, 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 and some of them, we already know how to do them. The challenge is to get the resources and the will to actually organize it so this becomes a priority. I, uh had the same experience as what you started to talk with uh, 40 years ago when I did my internship when uh, they told us, well, you deal with psychiatric problems and if they have alcohol problems or whatever, they go somewhere else. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, my question is, uh, when uh, we, in the experience, uh, my name is Joe, by the way, and I'm a clinical psychologist and also a professor here. I. Um, often see a sort of revolving door between uh, the types of treatment offered uh, 
when you have a dual diagnosis. So you end up uh, going to a treatment center and they say, well, okay, now we're, we're sober and uh, depression uh, emerges. So you, or schizophrenia or something else. And then you go over to psychiatry and then uh, they treat uh, that aspect or they go the other way around. And it must be very, very difficult. Uh, it is very difficult for uh, many people with the dual diagnosis to be bounced around in this revolving door uh, of seg sort of separate treatment. Uh, what does the uh, National Institute of Health recommend in uh, sort of, whether it's a sequence or integrated approach or whatever, uh, approach is being recommended for a dual diagnosis uh, patients? And uh, the second part is what is really uh, realistic uh, in the way that it works in the United States and, uh, as compared to here. Well, in, in general, what the studies are showing is that the integrated care provide better outcomes. But what happens is that the fact that you show that an intervention that's integrated provide better outcomes does not necessarily mean that it's going to be implemented in the healthcare system. And it's actually in the United States uh, there are very few programs that have the, the integrated care of the mental illness with a substance use disorder. We're trying to actually partner with the American Psychiatric Association to create a curriculum uh, that will allow psychiatric residents to, to get trained into the proper management of comorbid conditions. And many of the chairmen of the Department of Psychiatry had pledged actually interest on doing, doing this. And, and I, and I, but, but it is interesting because once you create a structure, it's, it's sort of not so simple to change overnight, even though the data show that there are more effective methods to address the disorders. And, uh, and, and now in the, in the United States, what is going to be obviously facilitating it too, is that uh, with the parity law, where it is now, which was approved in 2010, it is now illegal not to treat, treat mental illnesses or substance use disorders. And so that provides insurance to those uh, with these diseases. So now, now there is more likelihood that they are going to be treated because if that's the other problem that we face in the United States. Not only is that treatment not integrated, that treatment is not existent. I mean, patients don't get access to that treatment. Uh, just in conjunction with that, what is uh, the... Uh the view of uh, intervention uh, in the community, or what we call here PAC models of intervention, where um, uh, teams uh, go out of the hospital setting into the, the community. community. Yeah. Well, we, we have multiple models that actually we're very much interested on implementing because in many ways uh, they are uh, necessary for uh, environment and communities or locations, geographic locations, where you don't have your classical healthcare center. And so the people that are in these communities are not receiving any type of treatment. And so there are several models that actually uh, integrate, uh, that work very close, close, closely with nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, that basically work closely with a physician psychiatrist and that then engage in the treatment of individuals with mental illness or substance use disorders. And, and in this respect, for example, ac access to telemedicine has been very helpful because then you can also do interventions at a distance. In, uh, and, and we started by discussing it and I didn't go into it, but right now with the opioid crisis, for example, this is becoming really urgent that need to deploy this type of uh, community treatment approaches in rural areas, because otherwise there's nothing there to uh, help patients that are, that are addicted. Um, can you tell us something about the effects of antipsychotic medications on patients with a dual diagnosis, um, with a psychotic disorder and substance abuse? Uh, do these powerful medications have any effect on the substance abuse part of the disorder? Or if not, what is your recommendation? Well, yeah, unfortunately, uh, no, the classical antipsychotics do not decrease uh, drug taking. And in fact, in some instances, they may increase drug taking. And these are drugs that are blocking the dopamine D2 receptor, and that's the receptor that you require for proper function of, of the prefrontal circuitry. 
So on the other hand, some of the atypical antipsychotics, more, most notable clozapine, has been shown to actually help reduce drug taking. So, uh, and now uh, clozapine also has serotonergic effects, so evidently other neurotransmitters are engaged in those, those effects. And I say it's unfortunate because it would be wonderful if um, the antipsychotic could be utilized to help a person curb the strong urges to take the drugs, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. And when they've, they've actually done clinical trials for patients that don't have psychosis, but they give them the antipsychotic to see if it will help them, prevent them from taking drugs, and it just does not work. I was curious what your thoughts were about state-funded heroin clinics, like across Europe. It's not very common here in North America, but there's one in Vancouver. I was just curious what your thoughts were about that. And I think there's one in England, and there's one in the Netherlands. Yeah, no, I actually, um, I've never been to one of them. I've read their reports. One of the, the things that uh, actually that, that cap, cap, captured my attention, but I think that these individuals that are getting in uh, heroin for the treatment of their own heroin disorder are giving very, very high doses of heroin, extremely high doses. And, and so I've been concerned about some of the arrhythmias that are generated when you are treating these individuals. Now you can make the point that if they are out there in the community by themselves and injecting heroin, they're also producing these arrhythmias, which is possible. And at least you have them there. If they overdose, you can do an intervention. So it is, uh, I mean, uh, in that respect, I, I have, because I don't have any experience, I don't know what may be benefits over other medications, for example, like buprenorphine or methadone or Vivitrol where you actually have an advantage over heroin and that these medications, buprenorphine and, and Vivitrol, not just are activating the mu opioid receptor, which is actually what makes you um, get the rewarding effect of the drug and prevents the withdrawal, but they are blocking the kappa receptor system. And the kappa receptor system is what makes you feel very uncomfortable. And so that is something that you will get with a buprenorphine. You will not get it with a heroin. So, I mean, and, I, and no one has done a study, for example, that compares how the effectiveness and the uh, rate of recovery when you have someone sustained on heroin versus someone sustained in um, buprenorphine. So, until one does that, one, one does not know advantages of disadvantages. And again, my, my, my knowledge of the heroin, use of heroin for heroin treatment is based on these very, very severe patients that require huge doses of heroin. Would they respond to other medications? I, I do not know. I, I don't know. My name is Shelley, and I'm wondering the best way to increase the dopamine receptors, and is meditation one of those ways? Well, you know, it, meditation is one of the areas of, the, uh, of uh, investigation for therapeutics and, and on addiction. And there was a very interesting study published something like uh, six years ago where there, uh, it was done by Michael Posner, and he recruited uh, individuals that were smoke smokers, students. And he brought them into the laboratory and actually didn't tell them that this was a study that had anything to do to cigarette smoking, but they were cigarette smokers, and he trained them to meditate. And he found after, I think it was like four weeks of meditation, their cigarette smoking went down. So it he went then to actually replicate to see if actually who could observe the same effect. And, uh, but this time he did brain imaging and he actually replicated that indeed the meditation was decreasing their smoking behavior, but he also showed that it was strengthening the prefrontal areas. So, it, but, but, so it, it's done direct, I mean, so it was, it's a very intriguing, uh, intriguing phenomenon because it occurred relatively rapidly. And again, in this case, the students didn't even know that uh, the outcome was they're smoking cigarettes. So, in, so strengthening the prefrontal cortex can also be a way to deal with the reduced dopamine receptors. You can go that route. You can go one or the other. And it's again that whole notion about you can intervene in more than one path. And it's about through the meditation and no one that I know has actually evaluated the effects of the, the meditation on dopaminergic activity. But I, I need to go back and do a search because I 
I don't think I've searched that term, but I've never seen anything like that, but I should share, share it. But I don't think anyone has looked at it to see if it also influences dopamine. But I, I, again, I, do know, I don't think anyone has done that study, but it, is, it was a very interesting finding. And now there are several, we're funding several researchers that are working on the value of meditation. I want to ask you about uh, the principle of uh, auto-medicating, self-medicating. Uh, under this idea of uh, negative reinforcement, is it uh, more related to the initial exposure to drug use, or is it actually closely related to the perpetuation of drug use and therefore addiction itself? And I don't think I understand your question. So you say the negative reinforcement? Does it influence individuals to be first exposed to the drugs, or is it thought to be a causal factor about perpetuating the drug use and then transitioning into an addicted state itself? I think that it, in some individuals, uh, being in a state of negative reinforcement actually makes them vulnerable and that not just because the drug is going to be rewarding, but because by blocking that state of negative reinforcement, uh, that's very, that can be extremely reinforcing. And I, 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 I bring this always to the notion of, in the past we thought that if you had pain and they gave you opioid medications, you would not become addicted. And now we're finding that's not the case. And it, if you think about it, if you have very severe pain and they give you an opioid drug, actually it can make you feel great and it's this great sense of well-being. But it's also the removal if you have intense pain and that removal that is almost like magic of the pain is extraordinarily reinforcing. And so that conditions you. So what you then condition, your brain has learned two things. One of them that these drugs makes me feel this well sense of well-being and it removes that negative reinforcement. And so the perpetuating of the behavior is driven both by the classical positive reinforcement, but that negative reinforcement now actually strengthens the drive. And in those instances, uh, you can see why the escalation into drug taken may happen faster than if you only have one factor driving it. Uh, if I could ask you a really short follow-up, uh, using the really up example we gave with the pain medication, uh, if the pain medication is losing efficacy, as the drugs are losing their ability to create pleasure in the individuals who are continuously taking them, how will the individual be uh, influenced by receiving, by engaging, sorry, in drug taking by negative reinforcement if the pleasure of engaging in the very action is withering as a function of continuous drug use? Yeah, no, and, and again, you know, it's interesting because we give explanations uh, that are rational of why we do things. And so a person that is uh, seeking the drug is, if you ask them why they are seeking, and I say in, in many instances, they say they already have that insight that says, you know, I don't know. But most people say, well, I, I, it makes me feel good or it makes me feel better. Or they also say very many times, I'm chasing that first high because they become tolerant also to that rewarding. But, but in a way, too, if you have this automatic behavior and you remove your hand, and I ask you, why did you remove your hand? You says, because I didn't want to get burned. But you were removing it, it's an automatic behavior. So it is uh, a process that triggers a behavior, and then you, you, are may, you, are, you have to give it an explanation. So it's, uh, it, it, that's where it's not so simple to, to say it's so clear cut. I think that this was an exceptionally stimulating, informative talk. And I thank you so much, Nora. Thank you. Thank you.